We've reached Wednesday night of the Holy Week, which kind of seems like it would be the midway point, but if you ask me, we're way more than halfway through, okay, because this journey started a little bit before, so I actually feel like we're kind of on the tail end here. And especially what we see here tonight, like truth, Wednesday night is all, Wednesday's like my favorite night of all the nights. Okay, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is my favorite night. And it is for a couple reasons. One, very practical, is that tomorrow we don't have to wake up at five o'clock in the morning. Okay, that's the number one reason. Okay, tomorrow we start at eight o'clock, which is like vacation. Okay, so that's number one reason we smile on Wednesday night. The second reason, and let's see if you picked up on this. Wednesday, there's a shift. There's a shift in the tone of the readings and the prophecies and the spirit that's in the air. For the first two or three days, okay, especially like Monday and Tuesday, but also Sunday. Yeah, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. The spirit is anger. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of wrath. We kind of talked about it the other night about how, about how that looks like. There's a lot of destruction. There's a lot of judgment. On those couple of days, we read about, okay, Adam and Eve, about how they fell and they messed things up. We read about Noah and about how things were messed up then and God flooded the place. Read about the curse tree, he, the, the fig tree he cursed, the temple that he cleansed. Okay, your house is left to you desolate. We heard that many, many times. The land will mourn and weep. Okay, there was one about a sword. I bring out a sword and I will not put the sword back in its sheath. Okay, there was all kinds of anger and all kinds of tough stuff. And it wasn't just the Old Testament, the New Testament as well. Like just last night, we read several parables, and usually you think of the parables as happy-go-lucky kind of a thing. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, okay, and, and prodigal son, things like that. But last night, we read about the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding banquet, and many were invited, but those who rejected the invitation, what happened to them by the end? There was weeping and gnashing of teeth for those guys. And then we read about a, a master who had two servants, and one servant who he wanted to reward got lazy near the end and he started to do bad stuff and that master came back and said, cut him in two, okay, and cast him away. Then we read about the the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins. And we saw that the five foolish ones, they were virgins who waited all night, but by the end of the night they heard, I don't know who you are. You're done. I'm I'm done with you. I don't know who you are. You're away. We heard a lot of tough stuff the past few days. But did you notice that today shifted? Did you notice? Did you notice that today, Jesus was happy? Did you notice that? You have to be paying attention. But for the first time this week, we saw Jesus with a smile. But before we get to Jesus, we're going to do a lot of flipping around here. So open up your lectionaries. Get your iPads out there. Okay, open it up. And we're going to start in the very first hour this morning. The first hour this morning. The first prophecy that we read this morning was from Exodus chapter 17. So I'm first hour of Wednesday in the morning. First hour. Scroll through there real quick. What do you see right there? What do you see? You see the people are what? What? thirsty. And what does God do? Moses gets upset at them. There's people's complaining. There's people saying, why'd you bring us out of Egypt? And it even says right there in the middle, Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And what did God say to do? What did God do? Give them water. The people are complaining and the people are being difficult as they always are. And Moses is like, these people, what do I do with these people? And God says, I'll tell you what to do. Let's give them water. Next prophecy. We'll skip the Proverbs. Go to Hosea chapter 5 and 6. It says, okay, look somewhere like line 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Talks about, in their affliction, they will seek me early, saying, let us go and return to the Lord our God. For he grasped and will... Heal us. First time this week, we heard that he will heal us. He will smite and he will plug the wound with lint. That's a positive thing. Lint is a positive thing there, okay? 
After two days, he will heal us, and then the third day we shall rise and live before him. So the first prophecy was about we are thirsty, fill their thirst. Second one was they're crying out for healing, heal them, no problem. Go to the next one. Okay, go to the next hour, sorry, third hour. <clears throat> third hour was from Exodus chapter 13. Look what it says right there. Okay, this is when God is about to take the people out and cross the Red Sea and give them freedom and victory and salvation. And it says, God did not lead them by the way of the land of Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the way of the desert to the Red Sea. And in the fifth generation, the children of Israel went up from the land of Egypt. And it talks about how God gave them a pillar of cloud to lead them. And he knew that if he took them from point A to point B directly, there was going to be some bad guys, and they were going to get scared, and they might run away. So God said, that's okay. Let's just lead them. Let's just go around. No problem. And then later on, we don't read right here, but we see that the people are like, the pillar of cloud is really hard to see. It's really hard to see at night. Okay, make it a pillar of fire. Like, no problem. Like, what, what you need? And God is healing, and God is providing thirst, and God is protecting, and God is leading. Next hour, go to uh, sixth hour. Exodus 14 and 15, really 14. This is the parting of the Red Sea. Be of good courage, first line. Moses said to the people, be of good courage. Stand still and see the Lord's salvation, which he will accomplish for you today. Critical word there is for you. Not just see the Lord's salvation, which he will accomplish today, but see how he's going to solve your problem today, save you today, heal you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Victory, power, healing, thirst. All of a sudden, things shifted today. Now, here's the strange thing. While things did shift there, let's look at the Psalms that we read. Okay, we're going to go through the Psalms. Let's start from the, let's start from the third hour, okay? From the third hour, just to go back just one hour. And we're going to read several of the Psalms. You tell me the theme of the Psalms. I just kind of told you the theme of the prophecies. Tell me the theme of the Psalms. Psalm, third hour, from Psalm 40. And if he comes to see us, he speaks in vain. His heart gathered lawlessness to itself. Sixth hour. I'm going to go through these quick. For behold, your enemies made a noise, and those who hate you raised up their heads. They devised a wicked judgment against your people, and they plotted against your saints. Ninth hour. All my enemies whisper together against me. Second time we heard the word enemies. Against me, they devise evils for me. And if he comes to see us, he speaks in vain. His heart gathered lawlessness to itself. Kind of a similar kind of a theme to all of them. Go to the 11th hour. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled and my soul is greatly troubled. Turn not your face from your child, for I am afflicted. Hear me speedily. So the prophecies were all about like, I'm going to heal, I'm going to give victory, I'm going to provide. Then the Psalms are like, heal, save me because they're enemies that are devising bad stuff against me. Keep going with the Psalms. Let's go to the evening. First hour in the evening becomes even more clear. First hour, eve of, great, of Thursday. Save me, O God, for the, flo- the water, sorry, for the waters flood my soul. According to your abundant compassion, look upon me. Save me for the waters flood my soul. Skip the third hour. We're going to come back to the third hour. That's a special one. Go to the sixth hour. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Rescue me from the unjust man who devised wrongdoing in their heart. They arrayed themselves for war all day long. They seem to be getting worse, not better. Ninth hour. O Lord, my God, in you I hope, save me from all who pursue me and deliver me, lest like a lion he snatch away my soul. I'm confused. The prophecies I just showed you were about providing protection, victory, salvation, and the Psalms I just showed you were all about enemies and attacking and a lion snatching my soul. How can this be today? The answer comes, for those who were here earlier, the third hour of this evening was a very important hour. Turn to the third hour, the gospel reading. The third hour was where the major event for today took place. And it was two events which are contradictory in nature, polar opposites. Mark chapter 14, verse 3 through 11. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, 
As he sat at the table, a woman came, having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not have always. See, Jesus is happy. Happy what she did. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. A beautiful woman did this act. Next verse. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. I love the word conveniently in there. Wouldn't want to be inconvenienced as you betrayed your Savior. How can it be that we have these uplifting prophecies and we have these miserable psalms? How can it be that on one day we see this kind of high emotion for the first time, that we see good, that we see victory, that we see promise, that we see foreshadowing of good stuff, but then we also see this toughness and this difficulty? Well, the answer is right there. In that gospel reading, we have the two polar extremes. And the reason why I love this Wednesday night, in addition to the early thing, like I, the late thing, like I said, for tomorrow, is because finally the theory turns to action. Tonight is where action begins. And from this point, like I said earlier, I know it seems like we're still halfway. We are we're pretty much done. Because from this point, Holy Week is a freight train. Okay? Once the freight train starts, it keeps on going. So if you turn around and you sneeze... Okay, you might miss serious stuff because from now on, every hour, it's not every day, every hour, significant things are happening and the, and the temperature is escalated. So you miss the first hour tomorrow, we're never doing that one again. Like you, you can't catch up, like you missed the first hour. And then you miss the washing of the feet, you miss that, like that's done. And then when we come tomorrow night, every hour we have significant events. Now we start to turn to action. So let's start with the lady. Let's leave Judas aside because we don't want to... We want to give this lady her due. This lady, in my opinion, is a hero. I love this lady. What's this lady's name? Nobody knows. There are three times where Jesus is anointed with oil. Three times, but there are four accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are three times that it happened and four times that it's written. The one in Matthew and Mark are the same account, Luke is separate, John is separate, okay? If you want to go chronologically, which of them happened first? The Luke one is in Luke chapter 7. Actually, I'll give it to you chronologically. Luke chapter 7, okay, where is Luke 7 in relation to the death of Christ? Okay, death of Christ is in Luke chapter what? <laughs> not 8, okay? It's not 8 is what it is. Okay, it's in 23. Luke has 24 chapters. Always the last chapter is the resurrection. The one before that is the death, except for John. It's two chapters of resurrection. So Luke 7, okay, first one happened earlier on. And that was the sinful woman who came in and cried and washed the feet with her tears. Okay, that's number one. That's Luke 7. And then you have John 12. Where is John 12 in relation to the crucifixion, the death of Christ? The death of Christ is John chapter what? 19. Okay, there's two resurrections in, in John. So this is 12 verses 19. So that's a week before. That was Lazarus Saturday. That's where we read on Vespers a few days ago. And that's where eventually that last icon, okay, that, that, the, where the icon will be there, that's what that is. Okay, Jesus in the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And then the Matthew and the, and the Mark ones is Matthew 26. Where's death of Jesus? Matthew 27. And the Mark one is in Mark 14. Where's death of Jesus? Mark 15. <clears throat> so this happened early on, Luke chapter 7, sinful woman. Then it happened Mary. It was not about sinful woman there. Mary happened on the week before. And then it happened tonight, the day before the Passover, two days before the death of Christ. And it's by a lady who nobody knows her name. But man, I can't wait to meet her. Because I got so many questions for her. This lady is a hero. 
all of Holy Week had been going like this, okay? Wrath, anger, destruction, ugh. It made you cringe every time you opened it. And then this lady turned it. This lady made Jesus happy. This lady made, you know what? Jesus didn't need to say all that he said. All he needed to say was, leave her alone, Judas. She's with me. But he went on. And she had done a good work. And the poor you have with you always. And she memorial. And everywhere, what's spoken around the, God, around the world, what this lady did. Like he went out, like Jesus loved what this lady did. Up until this time, the only thing we had heard from Jesus' mouth is about the foolishness of the people, the ignorance of the people, the blindness of the people. But now all of a sudden, Jesus is like, no, but some people. I love this lady. All week, we've been hearing Jesus tell us that in my kingdom, not in my kingdom, when I come into the world, there's two sides. There's with me and not with me. There's sheep and there's goats. There's foolish virgins and wise virgins. There's those who, we read the Matthew passage about how, who fed the poor and gave the thirsty drink and did it to the least of my brethren and those who ignored the least of my brethren. There's only two sides. You have to choose which side you're going to be on. There's those who say to me, that yes, remember the, the verse that I've been telling you every single time, it's become kind of my theme for this week. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. There's those who are willing and those who are not willing. There's those who are, who are going to say crucify him and those who are going to stand by his side. Like there's only two sides. And what we've been doing all week and what we usually do is focus on the side of what happens if we choose the wrong side. But tonight, we're going to do the opposite. What happens if we choose the right side? What happens if we make the right decision? And what Jesus shows us right here, he said, as bad as Judas is, as wicked as Judas is, as betraying as Judas is, for one night, put him on the shelf. Let's talk about the lady, because what she did. One question I'm going to ask this lady. My first question, where'd you come up with this idea? Where'd you come up with this idea? How long have you been planning this idea? Did you know about the sinful woman in Luke 7? Maybe, but probably not. That was a long time ago. Maybe she had heard about what Mary did. It was a few days earlier. It was in the same town. Like maybe she had, Where'd you come up with this idea? You know the best part? Where did she come up with the idea? Who told her to do this? Who told her to do this? Who told her to do this? God told her. Nobody told her. There was no sermon. There was no instructions. There was was no prototype. There was no protocol for this. This is why, again, I keep referencing what Abuna Timothy said a couple nights ago. Even yesterday I was in Leesburg. I made them repeat after what you said. Which is that the sermon is not the goal of Holy Week. Please, please, please. The goal of Holy Week is not the sermon. And one of these years I'm going to follow through what I'm saying, which is not going to give sermons. Not going to give sermons. Because the sermon is just simply what God has spoken to me. And I'm happy to share it with you. But don't you want what God has spoken to you? Like if this lady only listened to my sermons, she would never do this. She would never do this. And this is like the only thing that matters in her life. But she would have never done this if she only listened to our sermons. Did you ever tell anyone to pour any oil or the thing? In fact, we tell you in the church, keep the oil to yourself. Okay? You have to have a private relationship with God because that's where the voice of the Holy Spirit comes in. And I'm sure that just as the Holy Spirit was convicting her for days before this, saying, do this, do this. And she was like, I don't know if I can. It's going to be weird. The Holy Spirit was convicting her, do this, do this. I am 1,000% sure that he is convicting people here today, people on the other side of the camera. He's convicting people. And if all you do is listen to me and you never have that quiet time to listen to him, you're going to miss out. Because I'm never going to tell you to do the oil thing. We'll tell you the generalities. Pray is good. Forgive is good. Okay, lie is bad. Gossip is bad. Sleep in sermon, bad. Like, we tell you the general, the obvious things, the no-brainers. But the specifics? Even I thought about it. Like, I thought about giving examples of what the Holy Spirit might be telling you. But then I don't want to give you examples. Because I don't know what the Holy Spirit is telling you. How would I know? And if I give you four or five potential things, you're going to stick with those four or five potential. But what I'm saying is, what this lady did was so far outside the radar. Moses didn't do it. 
Abraham didn't do it. St. Peter didn't do it. No one else at St. Mary Magdalene didn't do it. Nobody did it, but that's what God told her, so she did it. So my question to you, I want you to think about, and I, don't, I want you to think, but not overthink. I want you to think, but not overthink. Don't overthink, don't over-spiritualize. What is God calling you to do? What is God calling you to let go of? This lady came in, took an alabaster flask, smashed the thing. What is God calling you to smash in your life? What is God calling you to rip to shreds? Enough. Can't do this anymore. I hate this thing. Tonight, like Wednesday is the night that I feel it's time to stop watching Holy Week like a movie. It's time to stop just looking at it on the screen, and it's time to get in the game. It's time to get in the game, and it's time to take an action. Don't think about the action. Just obey. Like, sometimes you hear the expression, I hear people say this, it's like, I hope it's going to be a good Holy Week. It's going to be a good Holy Week. It's going to be a good Holy Week. I don't know what that means. Holy Week is good. It's always good. Every year, Jesus dies and he rises. Every year. It's good. Don't say, I want a good Holy Week as if it's something to descend from, the, from above. The question is not, is it going to be a good Holy Week? The question is, is, what are you going to offer? That's what Holy Week comes down to in the end. It's all about an offering. It's about a sacrifice. The first sacrifice, right here. And what does he sacrifice? Everything. Lay down his life. Lay down his comfort. Lay down his ego. Lay down his pride. Remove the glory. Let me live among sinful men. Let me give them not just my life, my breath, let me give them my blood. Give them my own blood. Let me get on my hands and knees and wash their feet. Let me stand on the cross, or not stand, be hanging on the cross, and the only thing I'm caring about on the cross is not myself. I'm not saying ouch. I'm saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Giving forgiveness at that state, like, give, 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 give. It's going to be a good holy week. He's going to give. But the question is, how about you? How about me? What are you going to give? Are you just going to talk about his giving? Talk about his sacrifice? Sing about his sacrifice? Or are we going to get in the game and make our own? Don't overthink it. What is God calling you to let go of? What is God calling you to throw away? Don't overthink it. Just listen and obey. The best gifts in life. Okay, back to this lady. The best gifts in life. What classifies something as a good gift versus a great gift? Anybody know? A good gift is good, is practical. A great gift is completely irrational. The more irrational, the better. That's just logic, okay? I'm, I, I'm a practical person. You give me something that I want, I want gift cards to Amazon. I want gift card to gas station. I want free oil changes for life. You give me that, woo, thank you, God. Those are not great gifts, though, for most people. You try them in marriage, it's not going to go well. <laughs> Trust me. What's a great gift to give to your wife? Flowers. Why? Because they're completely irrational. Because it adds no value. But within a week, they're dead. So I'm going to give you something. Within a week, it's dead. And it requires work for you to even keep it that week. A completely irrational gift. That's what makes it good. This lady. Holy Spirit said, do the oil thing. And not just do the oil thing. What does she do with that oil? Like, again, I got so many questions for her. I, this is my too practical, and I'm confessing. Like, just open the oil and pour it. Right? Just open it. Pour it. And it doesn't need the whole thing. Probably like it was, you know, the guy with too much cologne? Like, it was probably like that. It didn't need. Like, but that's not the gift. The gift is in the smash. That's the gift. And again, there's always going to be a voice. There's always going to be a voice. I'm telling you what is God calling you to give up. I'm telling you what is God calling you to let go of. I'm telling you that. And I know that as soon as I said it, again, don't overthink it. Holy Spirit said, 
That's what we're going with. That's what the Holy Spirit said. And as soon as the Holy Spirit took a breath, another voice jumped in. And that voice said what? Why this waste? That's an irrational gift. There's always that second voice. You know when Judas did this? This was actually the second time he said it. Like he said it over there in John chapter 12 with Mary. He said the exact same thing. And I guarantee he's saying it right now in your head. Let go of this. Smash this. Get rid of it. But do I really need to do it all at once? Do I really need to do it now? It's kind of a busy time. Finances are kind of tight. It's just I'm young or I'm old or I'm somewhere in between. She was smart enough to ignore that voice because that voice is the voice of the enemy. It's, it's not even the voice of Judas. Judas fell prey to that voice. Judas, that voice inside him, voice of Jesus inside him saying, Judas, I love you. I'm going to make it great. You're going to rule with me with other 11 guys. We're going to be the best. But that little voice that Judas heard said, don't trust. And, and you can't, and he doesn't know what he's doing. And he's making all these mistakes and greed. So Judas was a victim of the voice. That's why in the third hour, you still have it open, we read, we sang the great hymn, okay, it's, it, we, we sing it in Coptic because it's very difficult to translate. Someone will some, someday do it, but it hasn't been done yet. It's called Avecinon, and Avecinon is just simply the words that are sung. In, in, in Coptic, the hymns don't have fancy names, it's just whatever the first word of the hymn is, okay? That's what we call it, very, very non-creative, but I mean, it gets the job done, Okay. And the words that we sung for 18 minutes, that's 18-minute hymn. His words were smoother than oil, yet they are darts. This translation says they are arrows, but same thing. His words are smoother than oil, yet they are darts. Whose voice is that that we're talking about there? That's the little Judas voice. That's the little devil voice. That's the little one that said, why this waste? That's the little one that said, don't you dare make that sacrifice right now. That's the little one, the the little voice that says next week. That's the little voice that says that's irrational. That's the little voice that says that's too much. That little voice, that little voice, that little voice. Well, we sang that hymn. The reason we were singing it for 18 minutes is we are saying, I hate that voice. I know that voice. That voice has been killing me. That voice is keeping me as a slave. That voice is ruining my life. And I know his voice is so smooth. He's such a sweet talker, but man, it's poison. I'll tell you something else. We'll come back to that in a second. I told you guys this, that, that the hymn of Echinon is the same tune as Pekathronos. Pekathronos is another Coptic word, which means your throne, which is the hymn for 18 minutes that we sang yesterday, and we're going to sing again on Friday, which is your throne, O God, is forever and ever. It's the exact same tune, just different words. How is it that these two sets of words, which seem polar opposite, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and this one, which is about Judas and the devil, his words were smoother than oil, yet they are darts. Why would you put the same tune on these two words? It seems like they should be polar opposite. Why would you put the same tune? I agree. Some things have to be understood by the Spirit, okay? (laughs) You didn't get that? That means you're not at a high enough level. Let the little children come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. The reason why is because yesterday, we started off this week by saying, your throne, O God, is forever. I don't care what the people say about you. I don't care if they put a crown of thorns on your head. I don't care if they spit on you. I don't care if they kick you dirt in your face. I know who you are. Your throne is forever and ever. And I will take you and your throne over all the riches of the world. You, God, are king in heaven and on earth, no matter what anybody sells. Thine is the power, the kingdom, or the, 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 thine is the power, the glory, the blessing, and the majesty. We know that, and we're declaring it. But you know what will stop you from seeing the throne of God? And what will stop you from seeing Jesus as king is that voice. So the only way to get there, what we said yesterday, is that's where I want to be. And I'm telling you, this happens every year in Holy Week. Tell me if this happens to you. Every year in Holy Week, we start off strong, and that's where I want to be. And your kingdom, oh God, that's where I want to be. But then the devil sneaks in there, 
And the devil tells us, but you got commitments and you got work and it's tiring and, and, and it's a long day. And the devil tells us all these different things. So we may, so that's why we come on Wednesday and we say, that same king, that same throne, this voice is the enemy to that. So we declare this voice, this voice is the devil. And we kill that voice. I'll tell you something the way, the way I am. I'm like a, I have like a visual in my head. When I'm singing yesterday, okay, and I'm singing, your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. When I'm singing that, when I'm picturing in my mind, Jesus on his throne, okay? And I see some people from Leesburg last night. I shared about this a little bit last night in Leesburg. When you think of Jesus on his throne, you can say words, like Isaiah said some words in Isaiah chapter six describing it, and it's so glorious. And John the evangelist said some words in Revelation chapter four and five, and it's even more glorious. But St. Paul one time had a vision of heaven, and he said, what I saw is inexpressible. I cannot express it. So I think what Isaiah said, what John said, but I think the reality, I think there's some things that just the the eye of the mind can envision, but the, the, the tongue of the mouth cannot say. What does that throne look like? How glorious must it be? Jesus on his throne, the crown, the angels, the 24 elders, the incense, the gold. Like, how glorious must it be? How peaceful, how joyful, how just extraordinary must that throne be? And then as I was saying that, a verse came to my mind, which is Revelation 3.21. Anybody know Revelation 3.21? I actually think it's on the back of one of these pews. Okay, you can look on the pew in front of you. Anyone got Revelation 3.21? I think it's one of the pews, but I might be wrong. It says this. If you know it, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my, to him who overcomes, repeat after me, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That glorious throne. That eye has not seen, ear has not heard, come upon the heart of man. That throne. Jesus says, like for me, for me, if I'm like put the throne all the way over there and let me just get a glimpse, just let me be in the corner. Like there's the throne, way over there. Just let me sit in the corner. That's enough for me, Lord. That's enough for me. Let me sit in the corner. Let me maybe every now and then peek up and see your beauty and your majesty. That's enough. But Jesus says, no. Do you want to know where you're going to be in relation to the throne? Jesus scoots over. He says, to him who overcomes, I will grant sit with me on my throne, just as I also overcame sat with my father on his throne. What king? What king shares his throne? You ever heard of a king to share his throne? Man, if you touch the king's throne, it bites your head off. It can chop your head off. You touch it. You think about it. That's what I was thinking yesterday. That throne. You're going to scoot over so I can sit with you on the throne? <sighs> but then what I was thinking today, I was saying, I'll let you know, your words are smoother than oil, yet they are darts. That voice, that little voice, doesn't want me to sit on that throne. That little voice doesn't want me to sit on that throne. So I declare war on that voice. What I was thinking today, forgive me, okay? You know Rocky? What's the best of all the Rocky movies? This is a no-brainer. This is not even close. Anyone, first of all, who says five, five doesn't exist. We throw you out of the church, okay? We banish you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The best of the Rockies by far. Not even close. I'm going to look at greatest movies of all time. Rocky IV has got to be top three. Okay, I'm probably going to put Top Gun in there and maybe A Few Good Men or something like that. But Rocky IV is at the top of the list by far. I think of Rocky a lot. The training scene, okay? The training scene, okay? Rocky IV, in case you haven't seen it, it's basically David and Goliath, but boxing version, okay, is what it is. And the training scene, where he's, and he's training for that. And I'm picturing that as we're singing this hymn today, okay? I'm picturing body blow, 
Basically, he's fighting this big Russian guy, and he's never going to knock him out. He just had to keep chopping, 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 chopping. He was saying, chop down the tree, chop down the tree, chop down. Just keep body blows, body blows, body blows. And eventually, the big Russian guy eventually falls over. You know Rocky's going to win in the end, okay? So that's what I'm thinking today as I'm singing this. I'm thinking body blows, body blows, body blows. Chop down the tree, chop down the tree, chop down the tree, chop down the tree. The devil does not want us to sit on that throne. And that's when we're singing that and we're saying, we hate that voice. We hate that voice. We're just smoother than oil, yet they are darts. Body blows, body blows, body blows, chopping down that tree. And I'm telling you, the only way to sit on that throne, the only way to get pecathronus, keep chopping, keep chopping, keep chopping. Because that voice, that voice is your enemy. I asked you what God wants you to give up. That voice said, don't be extreme. I asked you what God wants you to let go of. That voice said, why now? I said, what price, what offering God wants you to do? And the voice said, why this waste could be given to the poor, could be used for this, you could use the time for this. You could invest your energy in this. There's other ways to serve God. That's not the only way. Like, okay, the oil lady, like uh, no one else did it. There's other ways that I can show God I love him. I can sing. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come to church every day and I'm going to sing my heart out. Thine is the power, finish to end, start to finish. I'm going to sing, and I'm going to, prostrations, I'm going to do all that. But the problem is, that's not what God called you to do. That's not all God called you to do. She heard that voice. She punched. She walked up to the house. The voice said, don't go in there. Don't go in there. This is embarrassing. He's going to kick you out. She punched the voice. She walked in. She was an uninvited guest. Everybody looked at her. What she probably wanted to do is be like, oh, sorry, wrong house, whatever. But she punched that voice. And then she went with the flask, and she's thinking to herself, the voice is telling her, don't do it all at once. It's too much. People are going to laugh. And she punched, and she punched, and she punched, and she broke the thing, and it worked. Because Jesus said, after she did that, leave her alone. I want you to hear this speaking to you. She has done a good work for me. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial for her. Stop watching Holy Week like a movie. Tonight is the night of action. Stop watching it like a movie. In this church right now, we're about to sing it. Emmanuel, our God, is now in our midst. Jesus is there. Picture the scene back in, in, in Mark 14 and today. And in, in back then, Jesus was at the head of the table, the center of attention. Boom, check. In that room was also a lady, a beautiful lady, and a voice of God telling her to do something. Here we have many beautiful people and a voice of God inside your heart right now telling you that's the course of action to take. And in that same house, there was Judas saying, don't do it. Why this waste? And I'm telling you, all three of those factors are here tonight. All three of those factors. You choose how the story ends. Choose your own adventure. Remember that when we were kids? You choose how the story ends. Jesus here. Voice telling you the offering here. Voice telling you don't do it. Also here. You choose how this story ends. Why this is so important tonight? Because truthfully, tonight is the end of Holy Week. It's the end of the... Uh, let me say better. Sorry. I mean, it's not the end of the Holy Week. That's not the right thing to say. Come tomorrow. Okay, it's very good. <laughs> it's the end of the sermons. Like, we'll talk, but it's the end of the preaching. There's no more. That's it. The time has come to make a decision. And tomorrow morning, well, this is so important for tonight, tomorrow morning, we're going to join Jesus at the Passover table. He is inviting us to the table. We're going to open the curtain tomorrow. He is inviting us to the table. And what he's going to offer us is his body and his blood. But before he even does that, he is going to get down on his hands and his knees. And he's going to get a bucket of water. And he's going to roll up his sleeves. And he's going to wash our feet. He is inviting us to that and that. And that's just the beginning. I'm saying, don't show up at the party tomorrow with Judas. Don't be that guy who brings Judas uninvited to the party. Judas will be there. We know he'll be there. But don't be the one who brings it. Don't be the one who brings it. Get rid of him tonight. Tonight, we say in front of God, God, what do you want me to let go of? 
Not what did Father Anthony say in his sermon. We don't care what he said. Not what did I read in a book. No. God, what are you telling me that enough is enough? What are you telling me to break the flask? What irrational thing are you telling me? And God, tonight, like that beautiful woman who we don't know her name, but we can't wait to find out when we see her in heaven. We're going to be like that lady. We're going to make our offering. We're going to figure out like the lady. We'll figure out the logistics later. How are we going to We don't know how we're going to pay for it. How are we going to, we don't know how. We're going to figure it out. But tonight, make our decision. We're going to put our money where our mouth is. And we're going to put a smile on Jesus' face. Because of all he is going through, we are going to put a smile on his face tonight. We have a tradition here at STSA that we do on Wednesday night, <clears throat> which is after the sermon, we sing a song together. Okay? So we're going to do that, and the song is the same song every single year. And the reason why it kind of kept is we did it the first year, and then the next year we showed up, the PowerPoint was the same PowerPoint, so we're like, oh, if the PowerPoint says it, so we, like, like when it's in the PowerPoint, we just do it with the PowerPoint, like it's like the teleprompter, and the, like we just read whatever it says. So we're going we're gonna to dim the lights. Usher, maybe you could put the lights on number four, push number four on the lights. We are going to stand up together, okay? We can stand up together now, Okay. And what we are going to do is close our eyes. And we know who we are standing in front of. We're going to stand in front of God right now. And we're going to listen to his voice calling us and challenging us. Actually, no, better. Inviting us. That's the right word. Inviting us to be part of the story to get in the game. Let's take like 30 seconds of silence, stand in front of God, and then we sing this song together.